everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 188. This week the questions are taken from guide 237 on the SS Great Eastern and the Wednesday video which was part two of the series on the Vasa. Josh Thomas Moore asks, what are some of the most notable launch failures or disasters and how did they happen? There's quite a few launches that have not necessarily gone as planned, but two examples that always stick out to me whenever this subject comes up is first the USS Roanoke, one of the last US steam frigates, which had the notable distinction of joining a very small and exclusive club of ships that promptly sank the minute they were launched. So, yeah, that's probably not a good indication of them being built well. I mean, there are ships that have sunk on launch for somewhat more understandable reasons. Uh, for example, there was a large civilian vessel in the late 1800s that was launched into a river, but one of the anchors snagged. It got turned around in the current, and then obviously because freshly launched ships are very lightly loaded and very sitting very high in the water, facing a strong sideways current, she was flipped on her side. Okay, that's nothing really wrong with the ship. That's more just bad luck. Um, but yeah, Roanoke and a, a few others literally straight down the slipway, straight into the water, straight under the water. Everyone left scratching their heads wondering why that had happened. Um, usually when that kind of thing happens, it's it's normally either too steep a slipway or possibly um, they've got the weighting wrong. But for whatever reason, basically the ship hits the water too fast or at too high an angle and then water comes over the, and because obviously it's not subdivided, sealed up, etc., etc. as soon as the water starts pouring in, and it's got a lot of inertia behind it that's forcing it for that bit of the ship further underwater, it gathers enough water to just become negatively buoyant and continue the rest of its short voyage to the bottom. But the ship pictured here, HMS Albion, is noted for another rather n nasty launch failure. So the ship itself launched on the Thames near Blackwall, wasn't actually a problem. It stayed afloat, it did everything it was supposed to do. However, it was launched into a very confined environment, and the wave that it set up when it entered the water ended up washing away a bunch of the stands that held a bunch of people that were watching the launch. And of course, because it was a launch wave, there was also a fair bit of suction back and no further real major waves to push people back the way you would have if it was, say, a tide. And so about, I think it was something like 200 people that were watching the launch ended up being dumped into some very nasty water, of which something like three dozen of them actually drowned. So that was something of a launch disaster, although, as I say, the ship itself was intact. And incidents like that, which incidentally is one of the first major disasters ever caught on film, you can actually watch the launch, although fortunately the camera angle was such that it didn't catch the, uh, the wave washing people away. But um, that uh, similar things have happened since then in various launches but partly because of this launch they usually keep people away from the areas where the ships sort of the wave of the ship entering the water could possibly go um, so you can sometimes see that especially with river-based launches you'll see waves sometimes overwhelm the far bank or something like that which obviously if someone was there would be a bit of a problem and occasion even in sea launches launches out into the sea rather than to harbors if it's a relatively confined harbor um, you can also see where the waves hit jetties and keys and sea walls that if people had been allowed to be in those places it could have gone horribly horribly wrong um, people sometimes forget just how much mass a modern ship of any significant size actually has and therefore how much water it's going to be displacing the first time it enters the river or the harbor that is going to be its new home. Daniel Silverthorne asks, what exactly happens to the steel, or in this case iron, which is recovered from scrapped ships? Is any portion of it reused in the construction of newer ships, or is it by the time of the scripts, ships scrapping so old and poor quality compared to modern ships that the steel or iron is used in other commercial products instead? 
It depends very much on how old the ship is and what kind of time period we're talking about. So in the age of iron ships, actually quite a lot of that iron would be recovered for building new ships. So when you look at records of iron armour, for example, that's manufactured in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s and so forth, as well as major ship components, quite often you'll see the breakdown of iron used in them so um, and especially armor plates as well so you might see well that you know this armor plate is six inches thick and it was made from 20 percent new iron um, 30 percent recycled iron and 50 percent scrap iron and the, the recycled stuff will be i mean they won't usually call it recycled but effectively that's what it is and that that re that distinction is iron that's been effectively off cuts things that or bits and pieces of fresh iron they've got lying around that they didn't use in other projects but can reuse in this whereas the scrap iron is you know stuff that's been pulled off of old ships old steam engines whatever because when it comes to um recycling iron in that manner that's actually relatively speaking easy um, you can melt it down relatively easily or you can just reforge it um, get mo get rid of the rust it's not that difficult um, as opposed to steel now as time progresses and you get into steel production you have a few different issues one of which is obviously unless you're talking about the period in the run-up to World War One, or in the midst of World War Two, most of the rest of the time there isn't so much demand from the shipbuilding steel industry that you'd get much need for taking you know scrap steel and going through the extensive treatment processes you might need to make it good enough again to use in a, in a ship structure because a lot of it if, if it's stress expired you know, you don't want to just pick it up and reuse it wholesale. It would go, have to go back to the forges. The other issue is that when it comes to steel ships, by the time you're looking at warships, different parts of the ship will be made, now be made out of different kinds of steel. So whereas an iron ship might, to a large extent, be made un almost uniformly of the same kinds of iron same kind of treatment same kind of physical properties when but when you're talking about a world war one or world war two capital ship you're going to have face hardened nickel steel or face hardened steel with nickel and other trace components depending on if you're looking at harvey armor or crop armor or some variation thereof um for the hardened armor plates and that's going to have one set of chemical and physical properties the homogeneous armor that's used elsewhere is going to have a different set of chemical and physical properties the structural steel is going to have yet another set of different chemical and physical properties and so you can't really mix and match if you use an extremely brittle hard steel that was previously used in armor in building a ship as in building the ship's frame then it's going to break apart similarly if you take a relatively ductile and uh, steel from say a, a ship's keel and you try and use that for armor it's not going to have anywhere near the correct resistive values and it's not going to have the right chemical makeup to be turned into face hardened armor either so ship steel in the 20th century would usually go off to other purposes because it would have to be fully recycled back into completely different things and by the time it's gone through a full the full process the, it's not economical to use it as ship steel anymore because ship steel tends to be, apart from maybe some of the bigger bits of armour, tends to be one of the areas, understandably, given the amount that's used, where people look for a bargain <laughs> because you're buying in bulk. But at the same time, if you do have some of this very high-quality steel that was used in you know, the ship's belt armour or whatever, all the guns, the kind of very hard, very uh, brittle steels, they do make... Uh, it does actually make excellent steel for use in other purposes, especially cutting blades and, and tool dies and stuff like that. So the, the phrase, which is sometimes bandied around, especially these days where the ship is broken up and sent for razor blades, it's actually very much true. High quality 
um, warship steel does make excellent razor blades <laughs> and because obviously you can take a slab of ship's armor steel that was maybe you know as i bought in bulk and didn't cost all that much individually on the grand scale of things and you can turn that into many thousands or tens of thousands of razor blades and even if each razor blade itself is only you know not that expensive it does add up quite a lot uh, to, to quite a lot of money by the time you've used all of that steel michael sipbox i think asks many times i hear ship x or y had n torpedo tubes i think we need to know more about the different options of torpedo tube setup so for major warships in the time period the channel covers you have broadly speaking three types of launcher and three positions for those launchers and this doesn't necessarily cover the torpedo tubes that you might find on very small attack craft they're one of the areas where you could find all sorts of weird and wonderful uh, methods of launching torpedoes but for destroyers and upwards let's say the three types you have are the fully traversable deck launcher like the one you can see here uh, so this is probably the one that's most familiar to everyone it's the kind of thing you see on world war one and world war two destroyers most cruisers and the occasional battleship and as the name suggests, this is mounted usually on a deck, um, although it can occasionally be mounted um, somewhere else, in, in, apart from on an open upper deck. Then you have the semi-fixed or somewhat traversable launcher. So this is um, usually, usually built into the ship's hull somewhere. Um, not always, you do occasionally get them on upper decks as well. But as compared to the traversable, fully traversable launcher, which can be pointed in any direction, pretty much as long as there isn't a bit of superstructure in the way, the semi-fixed launcher will have a small cone of movement where you can adjust the exact direction that you're launching the torpedo, but not much more than that, which means if you've got purely straight running torpedoes, you have a very narrow window of opportunity on when to launch them, or more often you'd have an adjustable gyro on the torpedo that could in theory at least make it turn a certain amount after it had been launched and then finally you have the fixed torpedo launcher which doesn't have any capability of traversing at all it's literally just a tube that kicks a torpedo out in a fixed direction and outside of some very early launchers on cruisers and battleships um which is doing you know, pointing straight forward or something like that normally these kinds of torpedoes uh, torpedo launchers will have torpedoes that like the semi-traversable ones will have the option of being able to turn um, through a setting on the gyroscope shortly after launch you, you can do that with the fully traversable launchers as well there's nothing to stop you because i've torpedoes a torpedo as long as it's the right diameter for the launcher but there are inherent hazards with trying to set your torpedo to make a fixed turn after launch and with a fully traversable launcher you can avoid that by just turning the launcher in the direction you want it to go so in most cases so do that as a preference that otherwise you can end up with situations where torpedoes end up not straightening up again and then coming back round at you which is never really a good thing so that's your three types um and the semi-fixed and fixed tend to be single tube launchers whereas the fully traversable ones start off as singles but you can get doubles triples quadruples quintuples and sextuple launchers um, for those now as for the positioning you can obviously position these things on deck as mentioned earlier so that's probably the most common one that you'll see and that has the greatest range of movement but also has uh, some restrictions on exactly where you can place them because as I mentioned in a previous dry dock uh, you're fire firing the torpedo out of the tube from a relatively high position so you can't past a certain beam usually have those amidships past a certain beam of the ship if you want to have a on deck torpedo launcher it has to be at the side then you have the hull mounted launchers but above the water line so for example HMS Hood had these when she went to um, on her last voyage uh, quite a number of cruisers and capital ships in the pre-dreadnought period had these and they were occasionally retained afterwards on certain designs so this is a kind of a compromise solution 
where the torpedo can be is more protected because it's inside the ship's hull, usually using a semi-fixed or fixed torp launcher, but obviously um, has a more limited rate of fire because it's usually only, as I said, a single launcher in any one direction, although you might have multiple single launchers on some ships, and these still kick torpedoes out into the water. So sometimes they look like little hatches, sometimes they're a bit more obvious. If you look at the bows of quite a lot of pre-dreadnoughts, uh, you might find a rather obvious tube and cap fairly low down on the on the bow. And then finally you have the submerged launchers. Now obviously submarine launchers will be of this type as well, but the submerged launchers on ships are almost always fixed launchers and obviously have the greatest amount of protection because they are underwater, um, usually even sitting below the area where the ship's belt is, and they kick their torpedoes straight out into the water rather than firing them into the air and then having them splash down. Um, these ones will also have some kind of device to ensure that the torpedo gets a straight launch. So you might have seen in other questions you have some kind of guidance vein or fin that can stick out to help guide the torpedo past the turbulence of the water that's coming past the ship's hull. And they, whilst they are technically the safest in terms of very difficult to hit, they are also actually some of the most dangerous when it comes to the ship taking hits from other weapons because they require a what's called a torpedo flat or um, in most cases which is a large room because those launchers themselves are fairly substantial you've got to have the ability to load the torpedo into the launcher and you've got to have the storage space usually for multiple torpedoes all of which adds up to a relatively large room that is not really divisible and of course it has direct access to the open sea, it has to, through via the tube, which then means if that area gets hit, there can be a huge amount of water admitted to a single breach, as compared to almost everywhere else on that level of the ship, apart from maybe the engine rooms, where there will be bulk, and, and elsewhere in the ship there will be bulkheads and hatches to keep the water confined. And... You know, if that does get breached, it can be the death of the ship. On the other hand, if it stays um, clear of water and stays watertight, it can be the salvation of the ship. And actually, German battle cruisers had both of these happen at the Battle of Jutland. Seidlitz had almost her entire bow flooded except the forward torpedo flat, which is one of the re major reasons why she managed to almost make it back to port. Uh, she did actually ground and then had to be lightened and then sank in port, but regardless, um, because basically that torpedo flat was such a large volume of air, it was acting a bit like a, a life preserver or, or a life jacket tucked under her bow. Whereas Lutzau, uh, on the other hand, one of the breaches through uh, her protection was into the torpedo flat and that sank, that, um, well, it, it sank because obviously it was full of water, but that weight, which weighed her bow down, was one of the major factors in her sinking because the other compartments that had been flooded probably she might have made it home maybe if she hadn't been caught caught uh, at some point with those but the sheer amount of water admitted to the torpedo flat meant that she was basically doomed at that point uh, it was just a matter of time reaver asks this is about great eastern to my knowledge, this period of history has the efficiency of coal-based propulsion iterating and improving rapidly. So how did such a ship, built on such a fine edge of performance, manage to stay competitive for so long? Surely other ships could have come along later with better boilers and engines and left it too inefficient for its capabilities. Well, in a coal-burned per mile travelled, yes, you'd be absolutely correct. F relatively quickly, Great Eastern was outcompeted on fuel efficiency. But where she wasn't outcompeted for an awfully long time was sheer size. The square cube law really, really helping her there. Now, the reason for that being a massive advantage is that while steam propulsion, as you said, was improving greatly, for a very, very long period of time, this, that wasn't enough of an improvement to allow a ship to reasonably make it to some of the much further destinations without having to stop to refuel or, you know, having the ship 
basically just be a coal carrier whose sole function was to transport coal so that she could get to places, which was kind of self-defeating. Um, because of the square cube law, Great Eastern was able to go huge distances with a relatively speaking small proportion of her hull devoted to coal, and she could actually go the whole distance, which until you had things like the Suez Canal opening up, which physically shortened the distance involved, and much, much later advances in engine technology, there wasn't a competition for her. Then later on, whilst her propulsion efficiency might be quite low by that point, her sheer size again meant that she was the only ship that could carry certain loads, or she was the only ship that could carry them efficiently, because again, you know, let's say for sake of argument, using arbitrary numbers, that she's half as efficient as a more modern vessel that's half her size in terms of dimensions. The problem there is, though, that if a ship half her dimensions is twice as efficient, if you're trying to move something in bulk, like, you know, transatlantic telegraph cables or troops, when she was used as a troop ship, uh, Great Eastern being double the dimensions has eight times the volume. It's that square cube law again. So if you can transport eight times as many troops on Great Eastern as you can on a ship that's half her dimensions, it doesn't actually matter if the ship that's smaller than her is twice as efficient because, you know, it's twice as efficient moving one eighth of the men. Therefore, you're actually only getting getting 25% of your rate of return. So if you if you took eight ships of half her dimensions, you could transport the same number of men, but now they're using four times as much coal to get to, in that case, in her case, Canada. So it's actually more efficient to use the Great Eastern on account of her size, despite her engines themselves not being particularly uh, brilliant. And this is basically the, the defining condition of Great Eastern for most of her active service life until um, other ships start to become not as large as her, um, but approaching as large as her, and their efficiency has spiralled up to a point as uh, that, you know, this issue that we just described doesn't necessarily apply anymore. And because they are closer in dimensions, they can carry a much greater proportion of her load, which now makes the efficiency argument better in, the, in their case rather than in Great Eastern's case. Irgendinia, Irgenduo, I think that's how it's pronounced, um, <laughs> asks, why no all forward armament in the pre-dreadnought era? Wouldn't that simplify the armor scheme around the magazines and allow for bigger engines at the rear? Well, you do have a few ships like that in the immediate run-up to the classic pre-dreadnought era. So, you know, Victoria and Sands Parai, for example, and a couple of smaller coastal defense ships as well. But fundamentally, it comes down to distance of combat, I think. Because these ships were built in this way because they wanted to mount the biggest guns possible, and this was the only way to mount the biggest guns possible. You, they physically weren't building battleships large enough to get a pair of 16.25-inch guns fore and aft. Um, so the the other concern was, was, as I said, range of combat, because you've got to bear in mind, until the uh, very early 1900s, which is kind of towards the end of the pre-dreadnought period, battle ranges were still in the hundreds to low thousands of yards, you know, thousand, two thousand yards, if that. And whilst in the dreadnought era, all forward armament can make a lot more sense when you're battering each other from 15, 20 or 25,000 yards away, and over time the relative bearing of your target and you is not going to change too much unless you really want it to, and you as an all-forward ship can adjust for that. If your standard engagement distance is starting at, let's say, 1,500 yards and probably going to get down to triple digits, then the amount of time it's going to take for an enemy ship to get behind you is significantly less. The rate of fire is also relatively low, 
And so even though you're only going maybe 14, 15, 18 knots, the chances of somebody ending up on your stern quarter were relatively high in a large scale fleet battle at some point, uh, unless everybody happily agreed to just duke it out, at, um, you know, at, in battle lines as per the middle part of the Age of Sail. Battle of Tsushima happens just after the battle ranges start to increase. Um, which is a slightly different matter. But you've got to bear in mind that when Tsushima happens, the last generations of pre-dreadnoughts, for the most part, are actually already on the drawing boards or at the very least starting their preliminary designs. So while Tsushima does demonstrate that longer range combat is possible, there is still a little bit of what you might define as melee going on there. And so for the pretty much 95% of the pre-dreadnought design era, people are designing ships for battles where you might have enemies turning up from any possible direction. And as such, having a big weakness by not having your stern covered, by having an all forward armament, would be a major problem, which I said becomes far less of a problem once you get to the 1920s and onwards. Mr. Jean Doe asks... I just wonder at what point in history did naval design make a turnaround from advertising a ship's presence with garish paintwork to concealment? Was there a war or a battle that caused shipbuilders to switch naval design principles from overt to covert? It comes about from two things. One, the rise of smaller warships as viable units, i.e. torpedo boats and destroyers, because they need to be as stealthy as possible on their approach. So having some kind of camouflage paint, even if it's just a, a grey or a tone of blue, is much more valuable for them because they're very fragile, they can't really take any hits, and they're small enough that they, if you paint them the right way, they might get away with getting into torpedo range in a confused battle quickly enough before they're spotted so that they can actually launch and get away. So that's one aspect. But when it comes to the bigger warships, the battleships and the cruisers, and there's a reason I'm using a picture of a Sans Parai here, uh, the same one I used of Victoria in the previous photo, because it is pretty much a crossover, and it relates to the previous question, because it's all, it's also to do with this extending of battle ranges. Because if you're fighting at, again, 500 to 1,000 yards, with 8, 10, 12,000 ton battleships, there is literally no point in trying to hide yourself. You are going to be seen at that range no matter what. And if you can't be seen at that range, that probably means you're in such a thick fog you wouldn't see anything even if you had, you know, flares lit off or something like that. So whether you're in smart black, white and buff British Victorian paint or great white fleet, you know, red, uh, white and gold or whatever, it doesn't make any difference. So you might as well go for impressive and try and deter having to have the fight in the first place. But once you start fighting at 3, 5, 7, 10, 12,000 yards, as the new rangefinders, etc., come into play during the 1900s, then all of a sudden, actually, you're far enough away from your target that you might be lost in the murk, or you might be lost on the horizon, or in the waves, or whatever, if you have an appropriately toned colour of paint. Whereas at that point, if you are bright white or black and gold or whatever, you're going to be very easy to spot. So now it becomes a tactical advantage to switch over to a wartime dull paint scheme. And that's pretty much what happens. Um, as you can see here, Sans Pride, towards the end of her lifespan, has gone from the Victorian colour scheme to this much duller, more camouflaged scheme. Tremor 3258 asks... What's your favourite exhibit at the Vasa Museum? I mean, if you exclude the ship itself, which obviously is the star of the show, it's it's a very it would be a very difficult choice for me. There's a, a couple of sections which look at the crew, um, you know, reconstructions of what they looked like, plus some of the remains of the crew themselves, what they had on board. That's absolutely fascinating for me. Um, much in the same way as the sections on the crew of on the Barry Rose Museum are. But competing with them and possibly, certainly for me as a, I think as a 
repeat visitor, the crew section would probably be my favourite after the ship itself. But as a first time visitor, which is what I was when I went there in the first place, um, I think there's there's a section near the top of the uh, various display levels, um, actually near where the sails are kept, which includes a bunch of information like this. Um, I think it's also in the vicinity of where the capsized model that I've shown in a few different dry docks, etc. is. And it, it, this area basically tells the story of the Swedish Navy at the time and why it was doing what it was doing, where it was going, how it was operating, as you can see from, from this little display, which is talking about the various archipelagos that the Navy had to navigate through. And as a first-time visitor, for me personally, that was my favourite bit, because um, you, you can, you know, it, it, it's very contextual. So let me put a bit more explanation into that. Vasa is obviously an old ship. It's been preserved in polyethylene glycol. As I said, it is a fascinating vessel. But for me, obviously, having seen Mary Rose, I've seen another very old ship preserved in polyethylene glycol. Again, once again, Vasa is incredibly impressive um, and is and will remain the, my favorite, the favorite part of the museum for me. But, um, you know, stuff where you you can see the the clothes that the crew were wearing um artifacts from the ship again somewhat spoiled by the fact that i've been to the mary rose museum so often it was a different flavor of what i of other of stuff that i had seen before so it was interesting but when it comes to exactly how why and where the swedish navy in vasa's time period was operating this was new to me i knew that they operated and the broad outlines of Swedish naval operations in part because of looking at things like the Swedish Navy and how the Kriegsmarine viewed it in World War II etc but there's a very different set of circumstances when you're operating age of sail ships and Sweden is proportionally a much more powerful um, naval force than it was in World War II so for me this area that's talking about the history of the Swedish Navy was my favorite because i was learning something that was completely new to me um had a completely sort of new information but set in a familiar context of naval operations and so that was that was the bit i probably spent the most time in <laughs> just absorbing all the new stuff damn daniel asks why were aircraft carriers given armor belts if they were not supposed to be involved in a surface engagement does it have something to do with their torpedo protection so the reasons for carriers having armor belts were twofold. One, yes, they're not supposed to be in a surface engagement, but you can't actually guarantee that that is going to happen, especially with the way that a lot of carriers were envisaged in terms of their roles in the interwar period, operating forward with cruiser-only escorts, the f firepower, if you like, of carriers in terms of their aircraft complement wasn't as great as it would be in World War II, and so it was anticipated that, well, considering that carriers are fast and their escorts are fast, the enemy would probably send out their own fast ships to try and hunt them down. And that would involve possibly a carrier being caught, for at least for a time, under the guns of an enemy ship. Probably a cruiser. At which point it made a degree of sense to have the carrier armoured against at least cruiser-grade gunfire, because then enemy cruisers and destroyers, which are the fastest ships usually available, would have a tougher time harming the ship while it motored away, and hopefully launched some aircraft and its escorts dealt with it as well. The worry, of course, being that, you know, if you didn't have that protection and the worst happened, then it was very likely that your big expensive carrier could be destroyed very, very quickly. The other element to armouring the ships was the amount of damage that it might take from near misses, not just from shells, but also from aircraft bombs. Of course, if you're going to resist armour from bombs coming down from above, you want deck armour for direct hits. But if you have a big bomb dropped nearby, the blast and the shrapnel might very well cause problems by causing numerous small breaches at or near the waterline, or breaches higher up in the ship where the shrapnel might then go on to destroy something relatively important. 
And so by having armor protection on the side covering these vital areas, it also meant that near misses would be less likely to do severe damage to the ship. Because, it, again, it would be very embarrassing if, you know, someone missed you with a thousand or two thousand pound bomb, but because your ship was made of spitballs and hope, the blast and the shrapnel from that bomb managed to cripple your engines and then you were slowed down and finished off. So that was the other reason for armoring the ships. But, of course, the armor that you need to resist the near misses from heavy bombs is somewhat lighter than the armor that you need to resist direct hits from six-inch shells or possibly even eight-inch shells, depending on the carrier. And so the first concern about being caught by enemy cruisers led to the overall thickness of those belts being decided. John Smith asks... I wonder if you had any good books regarding the classic Age of Sail that you could advise to read. Well, since I'm in the process of relocating the library to hopefully have it all consolidated in a single room, here's uh, one shelf of Age of Sail books that I've managed to put back on the shelves. So take a look at all of those, um, see which ones pick your fancy. Admittedly, a lot of this is what I would term more generalist Um because I have a slightly odd filing system for my books. So there will be other Age of Sale books. I mean, obviously, I've got a bunch on Kindle and other digital ebook formats, but there's others that will be resting in specific national shelves. So there's a bunch more on British, specific British warships or um, sailing campaigns on the British shelves, American stuff on the American shelves, um, French stuff. There's a bunch of stuff on Vasa in the Swedish section and so on and so forth. Um, but these ones are, apart from the Mary Rose one, which is brand new um, for me, then everything else that you're seeing here is what I, I say would term generalist. So it may be na nation specific. I mean, you've got French warships, Dutch warships, British warships, and there's uh, sailing warships of the US Navy there. But it covers a fairly broad scope of ships in the age of sail as opposed to sort of being narrowly focused on a particular campaign or a particular era or a particular ship as again with the exception of the mary rose book david jaff asks a novel by commander edward ellsberg uh, called pig boats used a seemingly brilliant strategy to surprise u-boats in world war one a sub is secretly towed via a horse pipe while submerged by a merchant vessel the sub lags in a convoy to draw an attack the crew abandons ship as expected but it doesn't sink because it's packed full of wood the u-boat approaches to finish off the merchant ship and then gets torpedoed herself was this tactic tried and to what success so yes this tactic was used with a reasonable degree of success by the royal navy in the first world war mostly using these slightly older c-class submarines so the idea pretty much as you described have a ship towing along a submarine and then uh, end up with you know, the ship is attacked by a uh, U-boat come to the surface. The submarine casts off its tow line, goes around, attacks the U-boat. Hopefully it sinks it, job done, and, and everyone's happy, except for the U-boat crew. Now, as I said, it did work a few times, but there were two complications with it. One is that actually, despite the number of ships sunk, statistically the odds of your ship being sunk by or even attacked by a U-boat during any one particular voyage were actually very low. So in order for it to reliably and routinely catch U-boats, you'd need to devote a huge number of subs to the effort. And secondly, it required the subs to be towed by their trawlers or other merchant vessels for considerable amounts of time, which meant that they weren't available to conduct other operations. So effectively immobilizing a reasonable portion of your submarine force at a point when actually not many of them might actually see any action. So that was one problem, no dilution of resources. The other problem was that a couple of the subs were actually lost on this kind of operation. One, I think in one case, the U-boat actually spotted the sub and took countermeasures and in another case the ship that was towing the sub ended up wandering off into a minefield which was fine for the ship because it was a relatively shallow draft didn't hit any mines but it ended up towing the sub into a mine and then the sub was lost with all hands so compared with the losses suffered to the royal navy's own sub force as a result of the tactic 
uh, versus the amount of time and resources invested in the tactic, it was just eventually decided that actually there were safer and more efficient ways to use subs than this particular method. And also, kind of like with the Q-ships, it was a case of it'll work long enough until the Germans get an idea of what's going on and then it's not going to be very effective at all afterwards. Switch374 asks, I recently found out that the original Gatling gun company developed an electric motor operated version in 1893 with a rate of fire of 3,000 rounds per minute. Further development was ended with the development of non-electric machine guns and the company went out of business. In 1935, the Navy rejected the Orlikon 20mm gun due to a low rate of fire and low muzzle velocity. But what if, in 1935, a naval ordnance officer had known of the Gatling gun and, with a blinding flash of the obvious, thought ships have electricity supplies and the guns don't have to be all that mobile? And so the US Navy upscales the 58 caliber Gatling gun to 20mm, develops a suitable round and belt feed system, and by 1940 they have a mount with a 2,800 plus muzzle velocity and a rate of fire of 3,000 RPM. The US shares them out with the British. What would the resulting anti-aircraft warfare have looked like? So kind of basically what happens if someone invents the phalanx in uh, 1935? Um, it would be interesting, to say the least. Um, yeah, I mean, the a Gatling 20mm is obviously going to be significantly heavier than a standard 20mm. So you're not going to see anywhere near as many of them, especially if it needs electrical power um, at the rate that it would. One of the more amusing things is it's going to be firing off so much ammunition that on some vessels that receive a number of them, you might actually see them physically start <laughs> lifting out of the water as their water line, line load gets less because they're burning up so much ammo. I know it's a bit silly, but it'd be funny to imagine, you know, something like an Atlanta class that's been equipped with three dozen of these things just blazing away into the sky. And obviously props to whichever genius manages to um, put like every third round as a tracer unit, which I mean, at that point they basically invented a, a laser cannon. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, seriously, the weight and the power requirement will probably be the single biggest thing. You'd probably see them fitted onto ships more along the lines of the way that the quad and octuple pom-poms were fitted to British ships, which had similar weight issues, um, as opposed to the, you know, USS Enterprise, let's carpet everything in 20 mil cannons approach. But with that said... Um, it might it might prove very effective if somewhat hungry in ammunition because uh, i mean the the part of the point of things like the quad and octuple pom poms and then obviously later the twin and quad and sextuple mounts of 20 and 40 millimeter guns was to increase the amount of ammunition that could be put down range by any given um any given mounting once you've got radar guidance in place, it's going to be much, much more dangerous. As obviously the, the Phalanx CW, CIWS has been in more recent times. The, the, only, the only concern I would have at that point is that because you have fewer emplacements, and initially obviously they're going to be human aimed, one of the advantages of plastering something in you know, dozens and dozens of single and twin 20 mil mounts was that... You know, if one guy's aim might be off, okay, you miss. If two guys' aims are off, well, two two emplacements will miss. Well, but if you have 20 or 30 guys all aiming and firing their own individual systems, somebody is likely to actually be somewhat on target. Whereas in this case, if you've got, I don't know, say eight to a dozen mounts of these on a battleship, it's possible that with only four to six of them bearing on any one airborne target, no one has a correct bearing the colliery to that however is of course if anyone does go and get a correct bearing and actually hit something that thing is probably going to be torn to pieces within moments so swings and roundabouts there i mean to ensure that you don't waste all the 20 millimeter ammunition um i even suspect what someone might do if they're really being galaxy brained at this point would be to pair such a weapon with a regular 20mm Orlikon. So, um, 
you, you'd have a, a, a sort of a dual mount where as soon as you start firing the regular 20 mil Orlok and that uh, fires up the motor to spin up the Gatling and you'd have either a dual action trigger or maybe two triggers or something like that and you'd start to fire off your regular 20 mil and then when you're either on target or you think you're approaching to close to being on target with your normal fire then you also let rip with a Gatling um, which hopefully puts maximum number of bullets into the minimum amount of space necessary to take down your opponent. Um, how successful that would be, it would depends if you, you know used properly or used with great enthusiasm, but it might be a, a nice balancing act to work out between ammunition expenditure versus lethality. David Stange Jr. asks, if the Free French Forces managed to keep most of the French fleet in World War II, what effect might that have had on the Mediterranean theatre, especially on the Italian naval forces? Well, as I've mentioned before, I think there's a reasonably good chance that a chunk of the Free French Navy would be deployed to the home fleet, um, especially Richelieu in an era when the Royal Navy really needed fast capital ships to deal with the German fast capital ships, because ultimately although the Italians had more and arguably more dangerous fast capital ships in the Mediterranean than the Germans ever had at one particular time in one particular location, the problem was if the German fast capital ships got out, it would be a very, very serious problem for the convoys which Britain obviously relied on. Whereas if the Italian capital ships got out, well, they regularly did get out anyway. The British didn't have anywhere near as much um, of an eye on what the Italians were doing in their ports as they did with the Germans with their ports. Um, but ultimately, if the Italian fleet wanted to press any particular attack on anything other than a big convoy, which could be directly protected and you know being a, not a fixed, but a semi-fixed target, could be protected by slower but still powerful capital ships like Nelson or Rodney or various Queen Elizabeths, Basically, the Italians had to come to British targets to accomplish something, and that would mean either approaching something that was guarded by the slower but powerful British ships, or it would be attacking something like Malta, which is completely fixed and, again, um, gets rid of a lot of the Italian advantage in speed if they want to stick around. So Richelieu, I think, will, will stick around in the North Atlantic. Um, Dunkirk and Strasbourg, however could certainly make appearances in the Mediterranean and the French cruisers and destroyers would certainly be very welcome in the Mediterranean as well as as with their subs obviously uh, because you know a lot of the French fleet was designed to counter the Italian fleet so you have a bunch of big fast destroyers to chase down the Italian fast destroyers and very small cruisers you've got a bunch of fairly powerful fast cruisers which can hopefully match number of the Italian cruisers and where you've got the less well protected ones like the Duquesnes again I think those will probably be shifted off to Atlantic convoy escort duty where you know dealing with things like Hilfskreuzer and fitting with AA guns to deal with aircraft would probably be a better use of their time so I think weirdly enough you'd see the older crew uh, older French cruisers and the most modern French capital ships heading off to the Atlantic, whilst the other French, and probably the very old French capital ships as well, um, the older ba ba Lorraine-type battleship, uh, not Lorraine, Britannia-class battleships, of which Lorraine is one, would be sent off to the Atlantic, but Dunkirk, Strasbourg, and the latest and greatest in French destroyers and cruisers would probably be used to either reinforce Force H or the Mediterranean fleet, um, which might actually end up leading to some stand-up battles depends what the italian orders are but generally does make the british and well allied chances at that point in the mediterranean um, a little bit better which might lead to some more offensive maneuvers by the allies because they now have the ships that they can actually do so john comtois asks seems like many ships are put out of action by damage to their steering gear. Could you do a brief history of steering gear from oars to whatever they use nowadays and point out the most common weaknesses and attempts to overcome them? Okay, well, if you want to do it right from the beginning and very quickly, initially ships were steered using large oars and these could be usually 
usually would be placed on the right hand side of the ship um hence the name hence where how you get starboard and port um so a ship would have a steering oar or steering board on one side hence the steer board or starboard side of things um and the other side where the oar wasn't would be easier to dock because otherwise obviously you might end up crunching your precious large steering oar against the dock side and that became the port side because that's the side you would put up against the port that's early um and as time progressed and ships got larger and the need for um a greater amount of steering force was required you might have ships with double steering oars so they'd have one on either side of the uh, stern and this kind of would remain the case in some way shape or form for thousands of years until eventually as ships began to develop you had the first full rudders installed and a rudder is you know, a big flap of at that time wood later iron or steel which is then attached to the stern of the ship on the center line so this gives a lot of benefits because now the the force of turning that's mounted on a on a ship is along the midline of the ship as opposed to if you're st turning using a steering or it's offset which can make maneuvering a little bit more hazardous also because it's fixed to the ship as opposed to lashed to it i.e. it's part of the ship structure rather than an external piece um, you can make the rudder a lot larger which is uh, an advantage because obviously again more steering force the downside is that you do need to then exert a large amount of force to in order to turn the uh, rudder and therefore turn the ship um, it also makes it slightly less vulnerable because if a steering oar is around then obviously there's a good portion of it above the waterline external which means it can be attacked by ramming or later gunfire whereas a rudder wholly or mostly under the water is much much more difficult to attack and usually is, un is mounted underneath a ship's stern which makes getting into direct contact with it a lot harder now the problem with with the original type of rudder the unbalanced rudder as it's called is that you know you are turning it on a spindle usually mounted at the front of the rudder at the end at the back of the ship against the full force of the water passing by the ship so you need huge amounts of torque relatively speaking to get it to turn which is why when you see old school ships of the line the wheat the ship's wheels um are also in many ways kind of gigantic pulley blocks and there's a lot of rope attaching to the tiller and why if you lose that uh, steering capability by having the wheel shot away or something you need a dozen or two dozen men on the tiller to move the ship around whereas before you could just do it with the one person now the one of the alternatives that's then developed to this is the balanced rudder which is developed in the 19th century and that's where the pivot point on the rudder is actually further back so 30 40 percent further back and that means that when the rudder is turned obviously you, the because parts of the rudder go, are turning in opposite directions relative to the um, ship so part of it is going to starboard part of it's going to port that means the pressure of the water or the other way around whatever um, but it means that part of the pressure on the water that's going to the f on pressing on the forwardmost part of the rudder helps balance out the force that is being exerted on the aft portion of the rudder all of which is going in the right direction so you're still turning um but it means that the because the forces are a bit more balanced you need much less force to actually turn the rudder the problem with that they found out was that if your steering gear failed a balanced rudder tends to stay in the position it was last in assuming uh, that the spindle has or attachment point hasn't broken in some way or jammed which is obviously bad because if your steering stops working and you have a balanced rudder you're just going to go in circles forever um, and so that then led to the adoption of the semi-balanced rudder where the lower portion of the rudder is balanced and that reduces the overall amount of force you need to turn it but the upper portion is unbalanced more like a traditional rudder uh, which means that if the steering gear fails then the rudder tends to return to its 
original position in a dead straight line, which then, if you've got multiple screws, might allow you to steer using your engines to a certain degree. So that's some of the vulnerabilities of the actual rudders themselves um, in terms of how they're used, but also in terms of the other main weakness is that, well, the optimal place to have your rudder is at the absolute stern of the ship, which once you get into the era of arming makes them very difficult to protect um, because putting an insignificant amount of weight at the stern of your ship can do bad things for your ship's structure and you know it, it's not a very optimal use of protection but if you move the rudder closer to where your ship is actually protected then you're going to lose command authority from the rudder because it's closer to the ship's center of rotation and you're going to end up with a rudder that's mounted underneath your hull which is going to massively increase your practical draft which might make it possible for you to get into harbors because most rudders tend to be either mounted um, obviously at the stern of the ship but in an upwell of the ship's hull so that they don't increase the ship's overall draft um, or if they're mounted such that they project below the hull of the ship at the location that they're installed there might still be a slight rise to the hull to try and ensure that the rudders don't increase the ship's overall draft at all or by too much depending on the design um, the main issue is of course you know, the rudder has to be stuck out into the currents of water running past the ship in order for it to work which means you can't enclose it or otherwise protect it which means it's always going to be a point of vulnerability because even if you protect the steering gear with some form of armor which was done at various points um, you can still hit the rudder itself with either a shell that's gone short or a torpedo or whatever and if that's damage jammed or blown off then your ship loses an awful lot of capability which you know Bismarck is just one example of that happening. One small way you can actually overcome this to a degree is to obviously have multiple rudders um, and then if one gets knocked out you can use the other one but that's when you have to hope that the one that's got knocked out hasn't jammed in a position such that it's causing you problems. Um, obviously then that means you have um, redundant systems which is good for having backups but also means that you've increased the overall weight devoted to your steering systems which means you can't use that weight elsewhere um, you also have to make the choice of do you position your rudder directly behind the propeller as was done on SS Great Britain or propellers if you have multiple rudders and multiple propellers or do you position it away from those because there's there's good and bad points about both um, types of position so yeah rudders are a necessary thing but also something that will always render a ship somewhat vulnerable just simply by their existence and where they need to be and there's a limited amount you can do to overcome that class a cornet wants to know how good would jackie fisher be commanding a fleet battle of jutland style well it should come as no surprise to anybody that jackie fisher was an incredibly aggressive commander when it came to how to command a fleet if well if his writings are anything to go by and if the records of how he handled his ships when he was captain uh, and of both a ship and then later when he was leading groups of ships before he was uh, moved ashore and eventually all the way up to the sea lord so yeah he's going to be he's not going to i don't think he would act quite like jellico did although he's got a very sharp fine tactical mind in many ways like jellico did um but he's also a very technical um, technical officer. He understands the systems that he's putting into play. So although his aggressiveness is very different to Jellicoe, in terms of understanding how his ships work and how they should work, he's very much more like Jellicoe than Beatty. Um, he's also, again, but according to everything I can see from the reports of the ships that he led, a pretty good captain at getting his ships to function properly um, and to actually accomplish what he wants them to do so i suspect that i mean it depends where you put him so if you put him at the battle of jutland in place of jellico um he's likely to make roughly the same kinds of decisions as jellico 
towards the beginning of the battle in terms of looking for information, then making a quick tactical decision based on that information. He's going to want the battle line because he knows he knows that that's his trump card when it comes to the Grand Fleet's numbers. But if there's any one decision that I can see him making that would be different from Jellico, it would be when Sheer launches his torpedo boats forward um, to try and attack the Grand Fleet, or basically to hold them off while he breaks off. In the historic Battle of Jutland, Jellico chose to comb the tracks by turning away from them, and uh, obviously that allowed Sheer to break contact. With Fisher, if he thinks he's got the enemy on the run, I can see him ordering the combing of the tracks to be done by turning towards the Germans and probably sending in any available nearby destroyers and cruisers to make the German torpedo boats pay on the theory that, yes, they might come under fire from the High Seas Fleet, but the High Seas Fleet is very soon to have a Fisher-shaped problem to deal with, which is going to dissuade them from attacking his lighter ships. And how exactly that would have gone, whether the... I mean, the Royal Navy's got the speed to catch Sheer, because Sheer is hampered a little bit by the pre-Dreadnoughts and the Nassau's and Helgoland's, or whether he simply just manages to maintain contact with the High Seas Fleet enough that he is able to tell where they're going for the next morning. One way or the other, there would, there would have been another big fight, um, and you know, who knows how that would have gone. If you put him in command of the battle cruisers, again, he he's a very aggressive officer, but he's also a very safety conscious officer. So whether the battle cruisers would have been in a position where, you know, the, they're blowing up left, right, and centre, they may they may not be, um, which obviously massively changes the outcome of the fight. He's not going to let the Queen Elizabeths um, go the way that uh, Evan Thomas was let go by BT. Uh, he's going to make damn sure he has those things in his formation. In fact, given his attitudes, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he actually shifted flags, either shifted flags to Queen Elizabeth or, well, not Queen Elizabeth herself because she was in dry dock, but to Fifth Battle Squadron, or if he decided actually, you know, I'm if, I, if I'm going to keep my flag on Lion, Lion is now going to be part of the middle of the battle cruiser fleet rather than near the lead and i'm going to put the queen elizabeth forward as my foremost formation so he's going to make absolutely sure that he has the queen elizabeth to hand to start with and that is going to hugely affect the run to the south in and of itself because i mean one it's now two to one odds or near enough and two the queen elizabeths have some of the best range finders and fire control systems in the fleet so they're unlikely to make the range errors that bt's ships did at the historic run to the south and of course they have the longest range of any of the guns in that particular fight so it's going to go far less well for hipper because he's going to be engaged at a range beyond which he can re he can reply by some of the biggest and most accurate guns in the british fleet with crews that even if ev even if everything else is the same uh, which it wouldn't be but even if it was you know they they can and will hit you very hard much harder and much more accurately than the battle cruisers following you following them would which means hippum very well may lose a lot of his battle cruisers because his only hope at that point is to run fast enough to outpace the queen elizabeths but i mean as history showed that's not necessarily a safe bet uh, he's got to try and outrun and outpace them fast enough before damage starts apart, from, even if he can, before damage starts to add up and um, slow his ships down, at which point, obviously, you've got all the other battle cruisers following as well, and they won't have a problem apart from the apart from New Zealand and Indefatigable. They're not really going to have a problem keeping up with his ships at all, even even if they have to overhaul the QEs to do so. So the run to the south probably goes far, 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 far better for the British if Fisher was leading the battle cruise instead of Beatty. The only flip side that would might be that might be, I mean, Fisher's no idiot, but it may be that his aggressiveness might lead him a bit too close to the high seas fleet um, as compared to what happened historically. Although, given the 
windy corner the fight the QEs had to put up with because BT was incapable of signalling properly, it might not be quite as bad as all that. And finally for this week, Aaron Ford asks, After visiting the USS Texas, I was curious about the lethality of rivets. They seem to be a hazard to the crew if the ship was hit. Was this an issue? And if so, what was done to mitigate the hazard? Yes, popped rivets would be very hazardous to the crew if the ship was hit hard, because even if even if uh, the hull plating or the armour resisted the incoming shell, or it was an HE shell or whatever, um, the shockwave from that explosion could pop rivets and send them flying around inside the hull, which is obviously very bad, something that was experienced by riveted tanks as well in um, World War One and World War Two, And... Also, and obviously bomb near misses and so forth and also the shock waves could mean that even if you know the hole was breached and there's bits of hole flying around in one location rivets could be popping out over a much wider area so in order to mitigate the hazard there were a few things that could be done firstly armor was even into world war and world war ii usually backed with wood um, which meant that if the rivets did pop hopefully the wood would absorb them um at least in the areas where it wasn't completely blown in. So that was one way. Uh, another way was simply by not having that many action stations, basically any action stations that didn't have to be in proximity to the hull weren't. You'd be much deeper in the ship. And obviously the ship's comp compartmentalised, so if a ship takes a hit and rivets pop off, hopefully those rivets should be popping into passageways and chambers that are just not occupied, um, which, you know... If they're not, if there's no one there, then you can't hurt the people who physically aren't there. Uh, fairly obvious one. Um, and then, th finally, um, you know, rivets are big enough and nasty enough to do a lot of damage if they do hit someone. Um, there's not a lot you can do to protect the crew. You can't give them sort of body armor or anything like that. Uh, but this was why, when welding came about. Um, one of the some of the first areas to be welded were the higher portions of the ship, not only because it helped stability and weight, but because the higher portion of the ship, the superstructure, maybe even the areas around the casements, were the some of the areas where crew had to be exposed nearby to rivets. So um, as soon as welding came in, some those would be the first areas that were targeted by uh, conversion from riveting to welding. And that wraps us up for this week of The Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening. At the time of public release, we are basically almost exactly one month away from the trip to America. So title of the trip has been decided. And, uh, well, hope to see you all at various locations in the States in just over a month's time. See you in another video.